first memory of, of a vintage Bentley will be humming along uh, probably down Route 66, I should think, in America. It's my father's idea of a family holiday. We set sail and uh, went off on a nine month adventure where we did 28,000 miles around America and Canada in a, in a three, four and a half litre Bentley. Being very fortunate to grow up around old cars and, and seeing what goes on and the, the labour of love in preparing them. My father was a tool maker by trade, so at an early age I was stood on a, on a, a wooden stool and learned how to hacksaw and file and then turn mill and so on. Um, and then I trained uh, as an engineer and then we were very fortunate to have an empty lock-up garage um, at, a, at a yard in Edmonton and I ended up wanting to build, build a career out of um, prepping and travelling with vintage Bentleys. And we were very fortunate enough to do that and then it just slowly grew from there and eventually uh, it got to the point where we were outgrown the yard. So um, pretty much nine years ago we moved here to this site in West Sussex. We built the business up to a reasonable size. Um, it was quite daunting moving here because the place was huge but within a couple of years we filled it and we've now got a team of 25 um, dedicated vintage Bentley personnel. We put a lot of effort into getting it right and making sure it stays right. We never have a car fail to finish a rally. We will go wherever we have to, to make sure that car finishes a rally. If something breaks, we'll fly someone out there, but we don't have cars fail to finish rallies. I was a tool maker. William opened up this just up the road from where I live. I sort of put a CV through the door. We had a little chat and here I am and he's very good at finding a role for you. He'll put you out in the workshop, see what you're really good at and what you really shine at, and then he'll put you into that role, which is how I ended up building engines. It's a dream job for me. Um, I've always been into cars and rebuilding cars and vintage cars, classic cars. So yeah, it was a dream job. We have the sales uh, arm, so that's our showrooms here, which feeds then through into the workshop. The workshops, uh, then obviously need a supply chain, which is our manufacturing department, and then the guys who are actually fitting the stuff. So again, that feeds back around to the manufacturing. So our stuff usually fits first time, which is important to us. And the lovely thing is for a client that comes to the door, they want confidence, they want the backup. And because we're not just selling a car, and after that we're not interested, we are selling a car with a service, what do you need, where do you want to go, you want to do a big event, you want to do a small event, whatever you want, we can back you up. Uh, and therefore you know that that relationship grows and we've had people come through the door on day one for a coffee and don't own a pre-war car and within a few years they've got five vintage Bentleys and as predicted the, uh, the modern Ferraris or whatever have gone off into storage and uh, the vintage Bentleys are pride of place because these, these go anywhere. It's, it's an interesting career path for me from going on physically on the tools and building every car and putting every nut and bolt in to then see the pleasure in, in scaling that. You just, you see it evolve and then you get involved in the business side of things where a lot of businesses build to a certain level and then stall to break through that ceiling, um, those inflection points and actually set up a proper business structure, which I'm very pleased to say we have from a, from a financial director down to a manufacturing manager uh, and our ops manager. Um, so now there is a good system in place and a good structure in place which frees me to work on the business rather than in the business. That then leads to bigger opportunity and more opportunity. And so stepping out of the workshop whilst that's um, uh, you know, something that, that you don't always want to do, uh, it's very important to recognise your skill set and your role and what your role becomes within the business. So where it used to be everything, now it's certain, certain items that are on my list and manage those and do them well. William's been embedded in this world for three or four decades, so I'm not quite sure. Um, from a young age with his father, um, and has always been known as an incredibly knowledgeable individual in this sector. I think so. That, and coupled with his tenacity, and if you get knocked down, you come back twice as hard approach, I think is what's allowed the, the business to grow, as I said, at the front end, and historically hadn't been supported as well as it might have been. Now I think we've got a business that is um, firing on all cylinders at the front, but is also able to uh, be supported properly at the back end with an infrastructure that um, never going to say it's 100% that we are very much better than we were. 
my passion's always been to travel. Um, when you when you travel and you meet people, you just broaden your mind, and um, it's just great to to see different cultures, different people, and see what goes on in the world. And so I've always uh, wanted to rally, rally these cars. Historic rallying is where these cars um, serve their best purpose by far. So um, to take these cars and go, and go rally is, is just awesome. And I was very lucky, uh, 2007, to do to be asked to be riding mechanic on the Peak de Paris. And I could see the level of prep and the level of endurance that these cars go through and realised that you know, we could do a whole lot better. So we then invested in that rally world um, to develop rally cars and prepare rally cars. So that's what's driven the business. And I've been lucky to do quite a few rallies now. There's two main streams. One is preservation. So we may have a car in that original bodied, very original, uh, had a very sheltered life. And so that would be all about preservation. We're not going to turn that into a rally car. Um, that you know, deserves to be looked after and the patina and worked in a very certain way where we're not putting anything modern on the car and, and preserve that history. And that's a huge responsibility. Equally, um, you may have a car that's had six different bodies and it's been around the block and the owner will, will be fully aware of that and say, right, I, I want a competitive car. I want to, I want to leave home drive to Monaco, race the thing, or, or do the Pinot de Paris. Um, it's all about performance, it's all about reliability. Um, then great, we can pull that every nut, bolt and rivet out of that car, turn it around and prep it, and it will do 100,000 miles and it will go wherever in the world he wants to take it. Vintage Bentleys are amazing, that there is no two cars in this showroom that are the same. Coachwork, chassis length, um, ownership history. There's a, there's a four and a half litre here uh, that has had one family ownership back to the factory in 1935 and then its first owner was the landlord of the Southampton Arms which if anyone's seen Peaky Blinders uh, was the pub in London. You know, just from a historical point of view and the fact that it's very original and untouched it's just amazing. Mr Bentley uh, really had a great eye for a good fundamental design, strong robust um, and quite big chunky components but they're very workable you can get them apart you know, pretty much six spanners and you can take the whole thing to bits. It's fundamental design you know a monoblock construction so you've got no detachable cylinder head you've got no head gasket to worry about you've got four valves per cylinder so on a four cylinder you've got 16 valves overhead can twin spark twin ignition and this was all designed in 1919 I mean the guy was a genius I mean what a hero My fundamental interest is engineering. So I looked at cars in an engineering way. And so as soon as I needed a part, it was, well, can we make that? How can we rebush it, save it? We've got a lovely research and development department where we are pushing the boundaries of where Bentleys can get to and where Mr. Bentley could have got to. We, we learn as they learned in period. Um, you can actually get the engine out in one piece if you remove this, this, and this. And we get quite proficient at doing things and you can live and breathe and feel what they were doing because we have, sometimes have to do the same. You know, this thing, this thing is broken, it's due out in, in three days or three weeks. Uh, it's got to get fixed and it's got to go and it's going to be on that boat. Um, so you know, we have those same challenges and pressures that the factory had. What we will absolutely not do is put a modern Toyota diff or an engine or something you know, and devalue this brand. This brand is all about Mr. Bentley's um, design and ethos uh, and we protect that fiercely. Um, importantly, I mean, for, for me, we, we manufacture parts in the same way that Mr. Bentley made them. So if Mr. Bentley forged a part or cast a part or machined it from solid, we will do all of that in the same way. And so we keep these things looking and, and being what they are. That grew organically again over time where I had a little lathe and then I got a bigger lathe and then we got a drilling machine and you just slowly invest in the um, engineering side of things because that gives you an added strength and depth and now we can manufacture just about anything um, in-house. What I'm driven by is data. I want to see how and why and understand that. Um, and and there isn't really much of that in the market. So I found a lovely young lady from Cranfield University and three years ago we embarked on a knowledge transfer partnership with Surrey University. 
So we brought all that together, those elements, and she weighed and measured every single component in a four and a half litre Bentley engine. She then built a virtual model and she showed us that model on her screen and there it is running and it all, all looks good. Of course, that means nothing until she put those components actually physically together, built her engine, took it to the university, calibrated on the dyno and calibrated, um, validated her model. So now suddenly her model has value because that is our engine and there it is. So now she spent a year tweaking and developing, really to find out where Mr. Bentley could have got to with his original design. Obviously he didn't have all this facility. The good news is there's spade loads of horsepower that Mr. Bentley could have tapped into and, uh, and we're just unlocking that now. So still a four and a half litre, still his design, but we can just, just uh, eke out a few more horses. Based on the, the computer software and the experimental work that I've done, we've have this con we have this concept that um, say, yeah, we can achieve somewhere around or similar to 200 brake horsepower. And we are making that prototype to validate that idea. Here is actually the engine. It looks exactly like a normal four and a half liter Bentley engine. Uh, the only difference is what's inside and what's on, on the top and the valve train, the, the camshaft, the, the valve, the springs and um, the rockers. Um, that's what makes it different. That's what makes it to be able to achieve 200 brake horsepower and reach 5,000 RPM. Competition is the backbone of this business. It's what makes things happen. We love a deadline. Um, we embrace a deadline. The whole team in the workshop is dedicated to prepping uh, 12 cars. We've got clients coming from all over the world to compete in them. Um, the pressure's high. That's what, that's what we like. Uh, and we need to perform and we need to deliver. So um, that drives everything in the business. We've, we've had some knocks along the way. We've limped home with some cars and we've got some cars across the line. Um, usually that's my car that I'm pushing to the, to the envelope. Um, but that's, that's how you learn, that's how you find out. So we'll put out my car, we'll do an event, which we've done for years. Um, absolutely drive the wheels off it, bring it back, strip it down, look at it, inspect it, see what's moved, see what's fidgeted, go through it. Um, and then as those failures come through, you then redesign that part, you take that failure away. So Bentley's obviously dominated at Le Mans, they won Le Mans five times, and that was through their endurance and their reliability. Um, Mr. Bentley didn't intend to go racing, but his cars were completely suited for it. They were known as the fastest racing lorries in the world, it's quite famous for Mr. Bugatti, and um, they were built for that long distance, that long endurance. So a, a 20 minute scratch race um, really doesn't serve many purpose. They've got the four cylinders, got two and a half gallons of engine oil to try and get warm, which just to gets warm after 20 minutes. Uh, and if you've got a six in the Bentley, it's got up to five gallons of engine oil. So, um, yeah, a 20 minute scratch race, whilst it's a lot of fun, um, yeah, that's not where they're, that's not what they were built for. So um, as soon as you can get into six, eight, 10 hours and more, um, they come alive, everyone gets warm. And as a kid, I'd look at these cars and think, well, you've still got the cars, why don't you go and race them? And um, I used to say, I'd pull my dad's shirt sleeves and go, but why don't we take it and race it? And why don't, why don't you do a 24 hour race? And oh, yeah, they don't do it anymore. Well, 2014, we did the first um, 24 hour race uh, since the war and seeing these cars thump around for 16, 18, 20, 24 hours, uh, yeah, they just come alive. That's what they were built for. You tick that box and it's gonna happen again, I'm, I'm pleased to say. Uh, and then a 500, so Chris organized the um, Ascari 500 so uh, that was a 500 mile race straight off the bat. Wonderful, these cars absolutely thrive. And now double 12 and the opportunities come at Goodwood to uh, partner up and uh, do two days endurance race. Back in period when they raced abroad, you could run through the night. So it was a 24 hour race at the Moor Spa straight through. In England, even in those days, um, they had trouble with the neighbors. So they could do 12 hours. All the cars were then quarantined, uh, locked up. No one could touch them overnight. And the next morning, uh, we'll push them back out on the track and do another 12 hours. And so we're going to replicate that at Goodwood. And um, there'll be two days uh, endurance race, start to finish, all the way through. And uh, that evening, Saturday night, will be quite fun because all the drivers have to go for dinner. 
No one's allowed to work on their cars and uh, it's going to be a really cool event. We've got 25 WO Bentleys on the start line. Um, please say today we've got 12 of those that we're prepping um, and we hope that we have 12 out the other side. Very lucky um, racing a, an original Super Sports. It's been in America for a considerable amount of time. Uh, we've just pulled it into the workshop and our challenge is to turn that into a race car and hopefully a race winning car uh, in 14 working days. So we are pulling it apart. The guys are flat out. It's a challenge for them, which they love. Um, we, know what we, we know what we need, we know what the brief is. Uh, and we're gonna see if we can turn that around into a race car. Uh, we don't need to test it prove it works, get it to the track in time for practice and qualifying, and we're off. And we may fail miserably, it might be a, a, a roaring success, who knows. What a great start to, to give it a good thrash round and, uh, and see what it will do. Um, so it, the, the brief sits with us to ensure it's safe, um, that it's gonna work and perform. Um, we know if we had an, an ideal car to race uh, at Goodwood, this would be it. Uh, so it's a lovely, lovely window of opportunity to take what we know and believe and, uh, and hopefully prove that, that it works. And we need to, we need to barrel around there uh, and just keep the pace up.